Imagine if the EPA said that 90% of your town's water lines contain lead. What if people had been living on top of soil contaminated with arsenic and lead for decades? That's exactly what happened to the people of East Chicago, Indiana. On April 5th, community leaders and residents gathered at the First Baptist Church for a town hall listening session sponsored by the NAACP and the Twin Ministerial Alliance with representatives from the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Housing and Urban Development in attendance. The real news was there, and here's a look. I know that this is not the first event that you've come to dealing with this subject matter. Those of you who are most effective have probably gone to many meetings, many, many meetings, in an effort to make sure that you are treated fairly and justly. And that is certainly our prayer and our desire for you and our reason for being here this evening. We wanted to hear from the residents who live in this Calumet area of East Chicago. We understand that many things have been said, done on your behalf, against your behalf, you know, in, in, in hopes that it's helping you in your behalf. But it's important, and I don't know how many people have actually listened to you and what it is that you need and what it is that you want. Well, I'll go ahead and introduce the panelists, uh, but we'll, if you'll reserve your speaking points till a little bit later. So we have, uh, first is uh, Bishop Tavis Grant, um, and next we have um, James Cunningham with HUD. And next to him, we have Mr. John Hall, who's the field director for HUD. We have uh, next to him, Dr. Pamela Pugh from uh, Flint, Michigan. She serves as the uh, public health advisor. Uh, next to her, we have the uh, National uh, Board of Directors for Environmental Climate Justice Chair, Catherine Eglin for the NAACP. Uh, next to her, we have uh, Douglas Bellotti of the uh, Deputy, um, Deputy Director for the Superfund Region 5 for the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, next to him, we have Ms. Jacqueline Patterson, who serves as the Director for the Environmental and Climate Justice Program for the NAACP National Office. And next to her, we have Mr. Richard Height, who is the Executive Director of the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. So if we can give our panelists a hand for being here. Thank you. So we're now just opening the floor for people to, anyone who wants to share their story or share their concerns, share, share the challenges. Um, okay, great. <laughs> we have one person. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Maritza Lopez. First of all, um, I've been a lifelong resident here in the Superfund site. Uh, my parents came from Chicago when I was six months old. And everybody, there's few people that say, they joke at me, but I'm in the sacred place and I give all glory, honor, and praise to God because I look as good as I do. But if you know my medical history, when new doctors see me, they expect me to be rolled in a cart, an ambulance cart. And that's actually how sick I am. I just got notices uh, within the last two, week, two weeks from specialists that I am actually in critical condition. But my main doctor is sitting in the royal throne. And I realized the purpose is because of this. Um, and I guess that's why I'm fighting because I grew up in the Superfund site and did not realize what was surrounding me or what I grew up in. I give no fault to nobody because none of us knew, but there were agencies that knew. And many of us residents found out, and I want to acknowledge the residents that are involved with the community advisory group 
recognized, of which I'm one of them, and it's uh, known as East Chicago Calumet Coalition here in the Superfund site. Um, we've been working diligently since October, weekly meeting the residents on all these issues you're discussing. But things that I suffer is my heart stops whenever it wants. I suffer seizures. I started losing my teeth by the time I was 18 with pieces of jawbone coming out. I suffered an aneurysm when I was 10. I had severe arthritis by the time I was 12. I was already fully disabled by the age of 38. Uh, by the age of 34, I hemorrhaged out of my left breast. I had cancer. By the age of 36, I hemorrhaged vaginally and could never have children because I had an emergency hysterectomy. I have now the strength and the power to say it. But above all that, I lost my older sister at the age of 43. She was suffering strokes by the time she was 28 and was fully blind by the age of 33. I lost my dad at the age of 59. His heart blew, high blood pressure, type 1 diabetes. My mom went through cancer twice. And the irony about it, she never drank. And they found cirrhosis in the liver. And that's a side effect of the contaminants. But she loved drinking that tap water because it was sweet and cold. My dad, my mom, my older sister, all type 1 diabetic. My baby brother. I lost him at the age of 44. Aortic rupture. He had hepatitis C, another liver condition. Doesn't run in the family. I am severely anemic. I have two, three wonderful children, which are four-legged. Two of them are service dogs. They're my nurses. I sleep in a hospital bed. And I've been sleeping in the hospital bed for years. No caregiver, no family. That's why I give glory and honor and praise to God every day. Because I don't know if the next second I'm going to be here. But in our CAG meetings, many residents speak of the same stories. Same illnesses. Same leg jerks. The neuropathies. So the ill health issues are main concerns. I just recently had a heavy metals test done. And that's because my specialist ordered it. My lead levels didn't read high, but a lot of my ailments show that it could be from the lead and arsenic. So my neurologist who deals with neurological disease it felt it necessary and communicated with the Mayo Clinic. In my heaviest metals test, they found, they found Lead and cadmium coming out of my urine. What's that mean? Oh, and there was a percentage of arsenic. So for arsenic to come out, that means I'm surrounded by it. And it has to be around me. I have to be either around it 72 hours or it's in my organs. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tammy Davis. I am a native of East Chicago. Grew up right on the other block at 4825 Alexander. And I'm glad to see that the NAACP is lending its voice and its leverage to this discussion and bringing in the noted experts that it has. Uh, primarily because growing up here in this community, 
this has been a discussion for over 40 years. I mean, it goes all the way back to my grandparents. Um, so this didn't just happen five years ago. Um, as we talked about it amongst our family and some other individuals that I would call alumni of Calumet, where we were born and raised here, but many of us have moved on to other communities. They talk about how this was an issue even when Nicosia was mayor and nothing was done. And so now that we're having the conversation about what to do now, how are we going to resolve the impact of this issue that has been going on for decades, primarily for people that no longer live here? God bless you for still being a resident. God bless you for your life and the breath and the anointing that God has on you. Yet we still have people that no longer live in Calumet that are suffering from the effects of this, but I don't hear their voices in this conversation or how their issues are going to be addressed. So that is something that I am very interested in learning, not just for myself, but for the families that no longer live here, but have been impacted negatively as a result of the lead issue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patty Gibson King, and with what the young lady just spoke on, I am a resident of, of uh, Calumet as well. Uh, was one of the first families as a kid moved to the uh, West Calumet. It didn't have a name when we moved there. It had all other names, but eventually they they called they came up with the name West Calumet. So my question would be to HUD. Uh, somebody on the panel that from HUD, who owns the land? My understanding is would be that the housing authority owns the land with the deed of trust with HUD. So we are in. Okay, um, sorry, with the deed of trust with HUD. So they can, they would have the housing authority has to get HUD's permission to release that land. Okay, so what are they going to do with the land once it's released? That's something that that's a decision that the housing authority and local officials are going to need to bank. And then they, then they have to make an application to HUD in order, if they're going to get rid of it or redevelop it, they will have to come back to HUD. Okay, one more question. But there, in the Kerry Garth School, it's my understanding that the EPA are already housed there for whatever it is that they're doing there. Aren't there EPAs in that building? Yes, we're, we're using Kerry Garth as we did last year as sort of a command post for the work that we're starting uh, this year. Uh, we anticipate within the next couple of weeks we're actually going to begin the remediation. And so it's, it's going to function very similar to the way it did last year. When you said that um, HUD owned the property, or the city owned the property, housing authority, housing authority owns the property with what? HUD backing it or HUD something? Subsidizing? Okay. So it's called a HUD declaration of trust. So it's an agreement that, that the housing authority has with HUD that says they can only use it for housing. So when they do applications, so they're right now they've got, they're working on what's called a demolition application to HUD in order to demolish it, but that still will remain in ownership of the housing. The land will still remain in the ownership of the housing authority. If they want to get rid of it for any purpose or redevelop it, they would have to come back to HUD to get permission because of what we call a declaration of trust. Okay, when they built the houses in that area, did they not know that lead was there? I have no idea because I was not here. I, we don't, I was not here at that time, so I don't know. People okay. that made that decision are not are no longer here. Okay, so when HUD houses are built, no no soil testing, no uh, assessment of the uh, um, soil is done before houses are built. So does that mean that any other housing uh, project that goes up, people have to worry if the land is safe to to build on or what? Because Everybody knew it was a lead, I mean, it was a lead plant there before they built. So it was common knowledge, and they still built the houses. So what I would say about that is that it, things have changed since 1969 when that was built. We now are required to do environmental assessments under the National Environmental Protection Act. There's lead safe housing rules. We didn't know the dangers of lead well, and you know, obviously we've made lead paint 
until 1978. So we've learned our lessons of what the dangers of lead and we've learned over time. Um, but back in the time when these were built, those were issues that were not paid attention to. They are now. So anything going forward since the National Environmental Protection Act was put into place and was passed in 1969, but not implemented until 71 after um, West Calumet was built. And then we've also had our lead-based lead paint thing. So going forward, yes, we did definitely take a hard look at that to make sure that not only the soil, but there's no lead in houses. That's why we have lead inspections. That's why we have all the, the lead safe housing rule. All these things are taken into account now. Good evening. My name is Dr. Linda Peterson. I'm on the executive board of NAACP. But I uh, speak tonight uh, because I was raised, I was raised on um, Vernon Street. And I didn't, I didn't live in the neighborhood, but like soul food, we had our Sunday family dinners there. I spent the night for uh, 16 years of my life, my other family members, we were there. But what's so alarming about me, um, my situation, I was at a, a, at a, a fair and I saw a, a board and it had uh, the issues with West Calumet. And I said, that's where I grew up. And I, had, I didn't have a clue. And then I went to my aunt who has the property on Vernon Street, and she said, yeah, I got a letter that the house no longer lives there, uh, I mean, stands there, but it, it was lead infected. And so we started taking a body count, and I started looking at my family, and my, my a whole line of first cousins are dead another line of first cousins have cancer. And on my way here, I was talking to my aunt and she said, next door neighbors, dead. On the left side, on the right side, dead. Cousins at the end of the block, dead. People across the street, dead. How many, I, I, and I'm related to Miss, Miss, Miss Davis and so, and I uh, echo her sentiments, what can we do about the people that are not here, but for years were residing in that neighborhood? What will happen to the homes here in zone two, mainly when the demolition takes place in West Calumet and after your land is cleaned, will the dust flow over again to my land and need a second cleanup? EPA? Now, what we're trying to do is once, once we clean up an individual's property, um, our expectation is that there won't be any recontamination of those properties. Uh, so we've done things particularly in the, uh, what we described as sort of where the, the housing project is. We've done things to try to minimize as much as possible any uh, fugitive dust or emissions coming off of that particular area. And at the time when we do, in the future, the, sorry, the cleanup uh, of that area, we do it in a way where uh, we, we suppress any dust that would come off of the property itself. Uh, we do pretty extensive air monitoring during the remediation process. So we know if there is any emissions, we immediately shut it down and we'll suppress those emissions. So the purpose is that uh, our intention is not, absolutely not to recontaminate any of the properties that are cleaned up. The question is that the soil that's being removed, where it's being dumped at, what impacts does it have on the community? Yeah. What, what we do, and we did this last year as well, as we re remediate each one of the properties, we remove uh, the contaminated dirt and we stage it at the, and I don't have the address of the facility, it's the Camorras facility, the old DuPont facility. And then they, and it's done in a way where there's no, again, no emissions coming off of the, uh, generally it's a roll off box that we put the material in and then we, we secure it. Then we move it over there, again, in a very secured manner, and we do air monitoring as we're, as we're moving the dirt from the property to the staging area at Camores, and then they will then transfer, uh, transfer the, the material to uh, an out-of-state disposal facility, basically a landfill. This card is just kind of a comment. It says, um, 
This is a grave concern as a taxpayer and voter. Why is our vice president, who was governor of this great state, ignoring the people of East Chicago? He knows about the contaminations we face, but nothing is he doing for Indiana, not even a recognition from him. We all want to know why and where is he? This is a question for the EPA. Um, um, my name is Akeisha Daniels and I'm a resident of the West Calumet Housing Complex. I was wondering why wasn't our furniture or anything clean before we were um, let back into our units? And what are the chances that we can take that well, we know we can't take the furniture with us, but what was the reason for it not being cleaned in the first place when you cleaned the houses or the units? That was part of the cleaning process. So the, the, the furniture should have been cleaned, and if it wasn't, that's, that was the intention. And that's certainly something I can, uh, I can talk to you afterwards. But uh, yeah, we did last year when we uh, did the cleaning, uh, it was a deep, cleaning, all the surfaces were cleaned, everything, all the, to the degree that we could uh, clean personal property, uh, we did the best job we could. We steam cleaned where there were fabrics involved, uh, floors, ceilings, pretty much it was, uh, it was something that literally took several days for each unit to do. So if it was for some reason an incomplete cleaning, let us know. We'd be more than happy to come back and, and talk to you about it. And I have another question for you as sure, well. Sure. Um, being that my unit tested at a 32,000 inside with the lead and 800 with arsenic, um, was it safe for me to even return to that unit in well, September? Yeah, after it was clean and we did sampling uh, before people returned back into the into the properties. But yes, we 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 believe that uh, the cleaning itself uh, took care of uh, any of the contamination that was inside of the, of the unit itself. But that's even without the furniture and the appliance. Well, my furniture and bedding being not yeah, being clean. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's one of those things that you know there you can only clean the materials so much, or there will always be some residual uh, material left. And you know we're we're really looking at um, you know what what material would uh, be released within the unit that would cause a health effect, and we've established health standards for that uh, within the unit. And so the intention was to clean it so that when we went back and sampled, we wouldn't have that problem and. And you should have been, the folks who did the cleaning or EPA when they were out there last year should have communicated with you on what the sampling results were. Basically, you know, is it below or above the, the action level for, for cleaning in those units? Uh, this is just a statement. Uh, where is the mayor of our city? So much concern. Yes, I have a few questions from the gentleman from the EPA. Uh, my name is Ezell Foster. I live at 4938 Euclid in Zone 3. Uh, just so, well, when it came out and did the testing, then I got the results. They said there was nothing wrong except in the front yard. Now, my neighbor, they just did her yard last year. They did the front yard, the backyard, the north side, the south side, even in the alley along the garage, the fence line. And then I found out I have an underground storage tank in my backyard full of kerosene. So then when they, they didn't have no problem taking down my fence, rolling the bobcat over my grass on the south side, but now you tell me I only affected in the front yard. And I don't think that's right. I just believe they don't want to do it because they would have to remove that underground storage tank with the kerosene in it. Jordan. We can, the one thing we can do, and anyone who has had uh, sampling done in their yard, um, we will provide you all the, the data of the sampling that we did on your yard. So we can definitely uh, sit down and talk with you and go over that. Make sure that, you know, the, the sampling results indicated in, in your yard that's not being addressed are below action levels. The one thing we are finding is that there are uh, properties where uh, we're seeing um, high levels in the front, uh, low levels in the back, or levels that in the front require remediation, but not in the back. N uh, next door neighbors are requiring remediation, but uh, on the other side, it's not, not necessarily requiring it. So it's a, 
somewhat uneven distribution of contamination across uh, the neighborhood. So you, you may see that there are certain areas of your property that might need remediation and other parts that, that don't. However, we will provide you all the data um, that we've taken on your property to, and sit down with you and go over it with you and, and uh, basically tell you what, what it means, what its implica implications are, and uh, we can talk to you about the underground storage tank as well. Okay, yes, I understand that, but I don't believe the results oh. because I live at, on the south end of Euclid, which is across the tracks is DuPont, but now five, ten doors down on the, to the north, they did the front yard, everything. But I haven't seen that one house in the 4900 block of Euclid where they only did the front yard. Every property I've seen them doing, they did everything. But I'm the only one that they say we can only do the front yard. Okay. Uh, perhaps you can uh, turn your specific case in to, uh, to the deputy director. Absolutely. Okay. This question is directed to HUD. Have you been approached by the city concerning the use of land after demolition? Will or can housing be built on the land? So I believe the mayor just sent a letter to the HUD secretary that we're in receipt of that made a request, that very request, and HUD has not made a determination of the answer to that question whether or not housing can be rebuilt on the site of West Calumet. I'm sorry, could you repeat that answer and maybe add some more detail? So the question, the question to HUD was whether or not we had have received a request from the mayor to build housing on the site, right, correct? It said what will happen after demolition and uh, perhaps then what else, what's going to happen? So, so as of today, there has been oh. no deter determination by anyone of whether or not what's going to happen to the site. EPA and I think HUD has, have approached the mayor to ask and the housing authority what they plan to do with the site. We were recently, the other part of the question was, has we have we received anything from the mayor? And the answer is yes, we just received a request. The HUD secretary received a request from Mayor Copeland to have EPA clean it to a certain standard where HUD housing could be built back on the site. We are in receipt of that. We have not answered it, that question. So, wait, please, 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 let's be respectful and orderly. The question was, so, what were, did right. we receive the request? And now what I'm saying is that, yes, we received a request. We have not responded to it. As how is it that you can uh, put all those people out of their homes and say that you can clean it to a certain extent to rebuild for some more people to come and um, stay in there instead of, you know, having the same people stay where they, was, they already were. I, get it. I, get it. I, I didn't say that that's what we're going to do. And a lot of our frustration, and this is something that we have been advocating, that is the Twin City Ministerial Alliance, at least four years ago when they made known to the public they were going to start the remediation process. I think one of the things I'd like to see us do tonight is to thank the NAACP for coming to East Chicago and doing what they're doing tonight. <laughs> along, with, along with the Twin City Ministerial Alliance, part of the fundamentals, and we've been asking for this from day one, that there be a legitimate coordination of services and service providers and agencies before decisions are made. Because in, in every one of these incidents, residents are left out of the mix, like uh, 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 service providers are left out of the mix. We have yet to have one of these meetings, for example, where St. Catherine Hospital is in the meeting. And St. Catherine, Catherine Hospital has a vested interest in this crisis because it's the closest medical provider in the area. Now, you can choose to go to community. You can choose to go to Methodist. But the last time I checked on MapQuest, St. Catherine is closer, which means that 
they should have the best of the best of the best closer to residents where they can get access to immediate health care and treatment if necessary. But we've not had the, the coordination of service providers, local and regional agencies. The closer we got, the closest we've come to it is several weeks ago when the governor convened and it was really uh, about a 60 minute listening session and everybody went back to business as usual. And so fundamental to this is, is fighting for a coordination of these service providers before EPA makes another decision, before HUD makes another decision, before the city makes another decision, before school city makes another decision. Because I don't know about you all, I'm tired of reading about it in the newspaper and finding out about it on Facebook. I mean, at some point, the chaos has to start. And our, a friend from Flint who's here can bear witness, the more that's coordinated on the front end and the more you involve the citizens and the persons most affected, the system works better. People can trust the system and trust the people in the system. Likewise, we've asked the NAACP to give us the legal assistance to legally readdress the allocations of money that is coming from the perpetrators of this crisis. If EPA gets $16 million for remediation and you don't get any, any money for the restoration of your home or even your health, it means nothing to have, a green, uh, have green, clean grass and you are dying of cancer. It means nothing. It, mean, it means nothing if you cannot recoup and recap, recover the, the interest and equity that you've lost in your homes. And so somebody needs to stop writing the checks and somebody needs to stop accepting the checks and make sure that people that are in the Superfund site are appropriately uh, uh, compensated for the loss that they've incurred at perhaps back 40 years. And my last point is there must be a strategy that is more than fixing the ground and demolishing these, these, these homes. There's got to be a plan that specifically talks about health care. This is a health care crisis. And you can get the test, but if you don't get the treatment that goes along with the test, you're going to die from what's in your blood. Your baby is going to die or be significantly debilitated later on in life. And there are all kinds of stories around this room of seniors who are currently now facing critical care. And it can all be tracked back to one area, West Calumet, living in East Chicago. And so we need a health care strategy that does intervention, that does prevention, and provides treatment. Now, what I honestly feel, I honestly feel this is just Bishop Grant you could tweet this. You could put it on Facebook. This is Bishop Grant, T-A-V-I-S-G-R-A-N-T. This is what I honestly feel. I feel like every resident in and on the Superfund site ought to have the same health care as the CEOs of Atlantic Richmond. I, that's what I believe. I believe that they ought to. I believe because at the end of the day, there is no way you're going to survive this if you're dying. Maritza gave us a living example of what people are going through all over West Calumet and East Chicago in general. And if it's not a healthcare strategy, I'm telling you, there could be new buildings, but nobody to live in them. I do have a question, um, actually three questions in, um, comprised in one. I'm Pastor Sloss's wife. Some of our members have come to me and discussed the fact that they have houses in the three zones and they are homeowners and my question is has there been any consideration can there be any consideration about the value of their properties being depreciated and if they're still paying for those or if they've lost all the equity in their home can they be compensated um, as a result of this crisis in EC, because you have a whole lot of homeowners 
um, that some of them are scared to say something and some of them just don't know what to say, but it has affected them as far as their, um, their housing situation because the banks basically are saying that their houses are not worth what they were before the whole issue was brought to light. So is something being done for the people that live in those zones that are homeowners? I think that's a question for HUD regarding property values, maybe? No, I think Reverend Rivera uh, made an attempt to address that this at, at our morning uh, discussion, but the property value is more of a local tax assessor issue uh, that uh, my understanding is Reverend Rivera had brought someone in, but it's not a it's not a HUD piece. So I'll start over. My name is David Chisor. I've met many of you before. I've been in a lot of the community community meetings. You may have also met my wife, Debbie, who's uh, with the Northwestern Environmental Advocacy Clinic, who's been to even more meetings than I have. Um, I'm with the law firm of Goldberg Cohn in Chicago. We've been providing pro bono free legal services on a lot of the issues surrounding this uh, community. We've held uh, one community meeting so far specifically directed to the issue of a loss of uh, property value. Um, and we're willing to have more meetings on that. We're currently investigating the, the possibility of filing a lawsuit against the polluters to try and recoup some of the losses regarding property values. So uh, there were flyers that went around around that original meeting. We can have another meeting about that. Um, but that's something we're doing. I want to stress we're doing it um, for free. Not as a, not. And when I say for free, I don't mean that at the end, if there's a recovery, we take some kind of percentage of it, none of that, purely for purely for free. If we find that we're that we have enough people who are interested and that we have a legal theory that can work, um, we're gonna file we're gonna uh, file a lawsuit over that. How you doing? My name is Thomas Frank and um, uh, there's a lot of issues and when you allow polluters to pollute there's so many cascading effects that that are affecting economic, social health and, and other things. Uh, and I can go into a lot of those things. But one of the things I, I, I wanna just, some real particular things is just going to the West Calumet example of cleaning up the properties and, the how, and going into the homes, trying to follow the pathways of the, the lead contamination. Um, it's fine that went into the homes, but logic would say if you're gonna clean up because you're thinking lead is inside the home and certainly we found high levels, how about the vehicles? Never tested the vehicles. How about the buses that the kids go on? How about the schools that they've been transported to? How about the workplaces that the, that the residents go to? Um, and that's with the whole Superfund site, zone one, zone two, zone three. Um, it seems like we're only able, we're bracketing this and trying to hold to the lowest cost and not really following where the pollution is. A good, another example is my children tested very high in lead. This, the, the health department in Indiana sent us a letter saying that they were lead poisoned. I don't live in the Superfund site. I live right outside of it. So those are, there are some parties that are not even a party to the privilege of being considered poisoned here or con contaminated. There are a lot of issues when you're in a heavy industrial region like this. Um, one of the things I, we've been talked to by lawyers, we've been talked to, they, they sent their limos, we've been talked to by politicians and experts. It seems to me that when change occurs, it's when people rise up and there's social movements. Um, and it's, we, we seem to find that there's a pattern here. When we look at what happened in Flint, when we look at what's happening in Detroit, the Kalamazoo River spill, what's happened in Elkhart, southeast side of Chicago, and other older industrial regions where industries have been allowed to do what they wanted to do. And I think we're asking for some responsibility. So anyhow, I'm gonna put a plug on April 11th. We're bringing those communities to East Chicago, uh, to the Maristar Casino, to talk about how we work together and, and, and address these patterns of behavior. Good evening, um, Tara Adams, Zone 1, resident. A um, couple of questions. One question, can, for EPA, 
Can you explain how you collect the soil and your process of testing the soil? Sure. We um, basically we depending upon what we're using the information for right the, this past uh, year we were doing most of the sampling for design purposes. So we would look at a property and basically grid it out and take you know essentially representative samples at six inch intervals down to 24 to 36 inches in, in a multiple locations within that property. We grid that out, say it was the backyard, we'd do that, and then we'd do the same for the front and, and the sides. And then each one of those data points that essentially we would do an analysis of. So each property would have essentially a multitude of uh, data results at each level. And we could, we could indicate, you know, zero to six inches, you had this at six to, you know, six to 12 inches, you had that and 12 to 18 and so on and, and so forth. So we'd be able to, with pretty good precision, determine, you know, if a remediation is necessary, how far, how deep the remediation would need to go and what is sort of the lateral extent of, of the remediation as well. So with that, you're mixing the soil, you're taking parts and you're mixing it. Could it be possible that um, in your mixture that it get diluted? Like I'm having all of this native soil or good soil here, but in this area, it's, it's, not, been, it's not coming up because you're mixing the soil. Could that be possible? Yeah, we try to do it in a way that we, we don't have sort of a dilution effect, if you will. Uh, you could actually have the opposite effect where you would hit, you know, for lack of a better term, a slug of contamination within a, within a property that wouldn't necessarily represent the, you know, the magnitude of the contamination across the entire, the entire property. So we, we try to do it in a way that, that we don't have that effect that what you're talking about. I fully understand what, what you're saying, but we, are we perfect all the time? No, we're not, but we try to be. So if a resident wanted you to come and retest, like maybe Mr. Ezell may want you to come and recheck his yard, would you be able to do that? We, we could do that. What I would want to do is have the resident talk with our project managers and go over the concerns that you have. We'll go over the data. And if there's any concerns or any problems, you know, based on that conversation, yes, we could go back. Okay, I'm going to um, after I'm going to ask her something, then I'm going to come back to the mic. Um, when will you let us know what your decision is for that land in West Calumet after all the residents move out? Are you going to, when will you let the public know about what your decision is for this land here? First of all, it's, it's not our decision. I mean, it's the Housing Authority will still... So they would need to come to us. They will have to. They would have to submit some kind of application, another Section 18, what we call a Section 18 application. So they would submit that to us. I think we're gonna. What we're, I'm, as I said before, what we're here today, and what we plan to do in the future is we're gonna have to have conversations with the housing authority, with the city on future uses. We are committed. We understand from this whole situation that there is a lack of affordable housing in Northwest Indiana, right? We're, so we are going to have to come up with a plan. We are going to work with the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority. Um, they've committed as part of the emergency declaration to allocate tax credits, A, to the city of East Chicago, as well as so, and another one for Northwest Indiana. So we are going to work with them to make sure that we have replacement housing that can help replace what's been what's going to end up being demolished at West Calumet. So we're going to have conversations going forward that I think everyone's in agreement that we need to include residents, we need to include the community on location, on style, and all these other things. So once, and, but to be specific to your question, the housing authority would have to come to us, and then we would make a decision based on that application uh, I'll be brief uh, this is just in terms of, of property values uh, and even the value of a facility of this magnitude uh, the fact of the matter is when you are displacing people uh, as we have in East Chicago people being displaced uh, if Strack and Van Teels lost 40 or 50 percent of the people that shopped in their store 
chances are they're closing. And when you look at what has happened to the churches, and not just the churches, uh, the school system, everything, it has negatively impacted the East Chicago community to the extent that when you say property values are not diminished, we have some people just the stigma of being in a Superfund site. People don't want to buy property there. People are apprehensive about bringing their children to a church that's in a Superfund site. And so I don't want us to lose uh, sight of that, that the fact of you have people who are being displaced, and those people is actually what make up the city of East Chicago. Uh, the last thing I want to say is this. Now, because of that, there's a referendum that in the same city that, that has been negatively impacted, the school system has a referendum where they want to raise the people's taxes to where they can't even have the kids play in the yard of the places where they want to raise taxes. And so on behalf of the president and the minister, we want the community to know where we stand on the tax referendum. Not no, but no. <laughs> Okay, going back to what Mr. Grant was saying earlier. Part of the issue that we have seen since not just August and July, but since 2014, 2012, even as far back as 1985, is there has been no cooperation between all of you on stage. HUD, EPA, ACSDR, the city, the state, and the federal government. Now you just mentioned that you're going to cooperate and you're going to bring residents into the decision-making process. Part of the issue has been, there has been no plan. The remaining residents of West Calumet wouldn't be facing the issues that they're facing now if there had been a plan developed from the very beginning where you all truly collaborated. Some of your agencies can't even agree on what level is the safe level for lead poisoning or for lead contamination. CDC is now saying 0, 0.0. And yet some of you are still going by levels of 400 or higher. Come on. If the federal government can't even cooperate and collaborate with each other, and then you expect the mayor to collaborate with you? What really needs to happen is you need to get together, everyone needs to get together, and residents need to be brought in at the center of that entire discussion. EPA shouldn't be fighting a motion to intervene for the residents to be heard because the residents have never really been heard to this point. You should be welcoming the residents to be a part of the plan. And there you need to have full collaboration between all Everyone involved, the city, the nonprofits working in the areas, the, the city government, the city council, the state HUD, the regional HUD, the state IDEM, the regional EPA, the federal I EPA. Everyone needs to come together and bring the residents into that discussion on an ongoing basis. Otherwise, we'll be back here meeting again in six months eight months, another year. Um, my name is Juan Andrade. I'm a lifelong resident of uh, East Chicago. And uh, based upon what the gentleman just said from HUD there, it, you know, and it's just my opinion with what we heard from our health uh, official from East Chicago say that West Calumet was one of the most contaminated areas in, in the country. It doesn't make any sense to build new housing when that, you know, he made such a statement as that because no cleanup is 100% cleanup, so it doesn't make any sense to build new housing when, when uh, that cleanup is not guaranteed to be 100%. Second of all, um, and this has to do with our health and it has to do with the city of East Chicago. In East Chicago, only minutes away from Central High School and uh, what used to be uh, uh, West, West Side uh, Junior High School, which is now where the kids are going from Kerry Gosh, we have a confined disposable facility, a CDF, which uh, I just recently learned, and some people just recently heard about this, is that we understand that the Army Corps of Engineers wants to bring in outside toxic materials outside of the 
outside of the shipping canal, which the Indiana Harbor Shipping Canal is supposed to be dredged and put in that CDF that's only minutes away from Central High School and so forth. So now we understand that the Army Corps of Engineers wants to get the permission or permit in order to bring outside more tox even more toxic material and dump it in, our, in that CDF, which would be a di another disaster waiting to happen here in East Chicago. So we're, we're dealing with the lead and arsenic and everything else in the land and water and everything else. We don't need for the Army Corps of Engineers to bring any outside even more toxic material and dump it on the minutes away from Central High School and where we have our kids from Kerry Goss. Thank you. Okay. Can I make it just to clarify? I'm not suggesting that we rebuild housing on the site of West Calumet. I'm saying that we should build, rebuild housing at suitable sites in, in the East Chicago and Northwest Indiana neighborhood, not necessarily at West Calumet. So that's the only business that you all are in, housing, right? Good, that's what they right? Do. You, don't, you don't rent the property, you're, you're, you're a buyer, right? So you know, you're I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we don't need housing. That's all y'all do is housing, right? Yes, Subsidize housing for poor people, if you will. Low income people. So now, this happened a long time ago I'm, uh, under the intimate domain, if, if I will. I don't know, and you, was not here, uh, wasn't part of HUD 47 years ago when they built that complex out there, were you? Nobody has been here that, that was initially came when the people moved out there from HUD, nobody. Because you cannot answer some of them questions that took place 47 years ago. Can you answer those questions? So this is who we need to talk to. See, you come in, you, you know, you knew, I don't know how long you worked for HUD, but in order for something to get built out there, it's gonna have to be houses, because that's what y'all do. It's, it's, all I will say is that it's, it's a lot more complicated. That the housing authority can, does not have to be housing. They can dispose of the property. Right, we don't, I, I'm not sure, all I'm saying is that we are, first of all, I think if we learn one thing from this is that we need to be very careful about where we build housing, right? And just because, and I don't think that we are going to build anything in East Chicago that is not environmentally safe for the residents. So I, I, I hear you and we're not gonna go back and build on this site. The housing authority can dispose of this out. The city needs, like you, the gentleman down here says, we need to work together to figure out what is the most appropriate reuse for the West Calumet site. That's working with the EPA, that's working with you, the residents, working with the mayor. Do you know how we got out there? Under the intimate domain. They, right. they came in our neighborhood right. and moved and my mom now, rest assured, they paid them to move there. Not once, twice. They paid them to move out there. They already had this plan. Yep. And then they came there with trailer houses to contain the people until they put this West Cayman up. Like I said, they didn't have a name then. They didn't have a name then. So you're requesting like an ordinance that would not allow eminent domain to occur. That That is your demand. Same thing, but they're trying to say it's lead now. I have a question for EPA. Uh, since you did all that cleaning and all that stuff, is our water contaminated? I'm actually looking at the at the audience. Oh, we no, no, I see you. Um, I had asked. <laughs> we had a person here from our water program, um, Miguel Del Toro. Uh, who is sort of the expert that EPA uses, and I do not see Miguel. Is he in the hall? Could you get him? He was make, doing a demonstration on the filters. Okay, so um, for those that didn't hear, she was wondering if the, the cleanup work for the soil has contaminated the water. No, uh, yeah, the short answer is no, but uh, just I wanted to explain briefly what what we did so you so that you okay uh, when I got a call that the cleanup was in front of homes in East Chicago in zones two and three uh, there was a concern that because of what has happened elsewhere that vibrating the ground disturbing those lead pipes could knock off a lot of the lead inside the scale inside these pipes into the water no it means that that was the concern 
we, so we did sampling before and after, right? And we're just finishing up our assessment on that and we'll, we'll put it out. But long story short, we have not seen any widespread issues with that at all. Uh, my understanding, based on my uh, research or advocacy, is that it is the water is, is over 15 parts per billion, and whenever it is, it's not uh, for consumption. And so the Indiana Department of Environmental Management is coming April the 13th to disseminate uh, free water, uh, water faucets, uh, filtration systems for your faucets, uh, as well as some filters. And it's to go to everyone living in zone two and zone three. Uh, when we did the crisis tour today, uh, we were uh, reassured again that it was every single resident in zone two and zone three, because at one point I was told it was only people whose soil was being, uh, has been, uh, confirmed as uh, contaminated. But I've since been told everyone in zone two and three is to receive a filtration system. So make sure that that occurs. Okay, I'm gonna let the NRDC representative uh, also address that question and then I'll run back to you. Thanks, my name is Malia Gertzma. I'm an attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. And we recently worked with some of the um, other attorneys who are working with the residents to file a petition with EPA over the water quality issues in the city. And I wanted to clarify a little bit what was just said by the EPA representative. It's my understanding that there's not evidence that the work being done on the soil is impacting the water quality. But what was found is that there was a broader water quality problem that extends beyond the site itself and potentially to the entire city. And that there's a concern that that problem is because there was not proper treatment of the water going on to prevent lead from leaching out of the pipes. So while the two are not necessarily connected, the soil problem and the water problem, there is a water problem on top of the soil problem because there is a problem with the system as a whole. It's my understanding too that some steps are being taken to try to get that treatment where it needs to be, but that that's going to take some time and that that's why we're working with a number of different groups and, and with people in the room to try to ensure that residents at the Superfund site first and foremost get the filters and get um, bottled water if they need it in the meantime, but also that people in the city as a whole are aware that they may have a drinking water problem and that, um, that the state and the city and the federal government are responding to make sure those other residents also are getting filters and drinking water and bottled water until the treatment can be um, ensured that it's protecting the system. Oh, uh, IDEM just sent out a press release saying that uh, the lead contamination that they've seen recently from the excavated uh, areas, that it was because of the disruption of the pipes and the, and the uh, excavation, which loosened the scaling that uh, led to their high levels of lead in the water. So does uh, EPA say, that is why you also found high levels of lead in the water? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna have Miguel address that. Miguel actually was involved in the design of the pilot study that yeah, originally study. identified uh, some elevated levels uh, prior to the uh, remediation uh, at, uh, at different properties uh, at the site. So I'll let Miguel handle that. Yeah, um, so what we did was we, we took samples and collected the water all the way from the kitchen tap to the water main at every home, 43 homes, um, and then after that, uh, we didn't quite get all 43, but what the, the point was to collect the water all the way 
uh, out to the water main under the street so that we check what it's like before any work is done and then we do the same uh, pretty comprehensive sample sampling after they finish all the work and restore the site and then we compare the two to see if the actual work, the soil cleanup work, did anything to the lead in water. And generally what we found is no. Um, we're finishing up the, the assessment now. Uh, there was one site uh, that we know was disturbed, but it will, um, we don't know quite why it was disturbed. Uh, it, it was clearly not done across the board. So in other words, it wasn't that it was being impacted everywhere. Hi, um, my name is Sherry Hunter. I'm with Calumet Lives Matter. I want to ask you a question about um, in the West Calumet complex. Is it okay to dig? I mean, is it such a thing as like the lead is, what is it, airborne? airborne? Is that harmful? What we've done in that area, and we did this last year, and uh, because we didn't start the cleanup in that area as we had originally planned, uh, what we tried to do is to you know, cut off any exposure from any other soil there. So any bare soil, we, we uh, tried to cover and maintain that cover throughout, throughout the summer months. So until the soil is remediated, mm -hmm. I think our advice would be not to dig into the soil itself. And, and if there's any areas that you've seen where you know, uh, soil is exposed or it's, it's bare, it doesn't have like a mulch cover or mm -hmm. something like that, you know, please let us know. Uh, as I indicated earlier, we're in the process of mobilizing right now. Um, so we'll be available um, literally on a on a day-to-day -day basis and you could you're we're setting up shop again as i said in kerry gosh so you can come by drop by and let us know if there's an area that you're concerned about okay the reason why i brought it up because monday out there in the west calumet complex back in the back with a park the baseball uh, basketball court and then they have a little park where the kids play the city was out there with digging to uh, uh, turning the dirt up tear tore down the swings the slide and everything. All these kids was out there. They turned the dirt up. And you know, so the lead was airborne. And this was city trucks that did this, not housing. Just to let you know, they, they did not talk to us. We were as surprised as you were when we heard about that after the fact. I would like for HUD to explain to the residents here that when you talk about affordable housing, many of the residents here are not familiar with HUD terms. So affordable housing does not necessarily, not necessarily mean rental units. So when you talk about affordable housing that can happen in West Calumet, you can build homes similar to the ones that you have in the harbor, and they do not, they are not affordable housing for people whose credit is, you know, have credit issues. So affordable housing, Mr. Hall, could you explain that that means that those are not necessarily rental units, but they're purchase units? Thank you. Well, affordable housing, you know, is a, a very wide term, but, it, but the, I think the question was, what will the East Chicago Housing Authority be responsible for building? And, and uh, the trends today are, you know, mixed income kinds of housing, public housing, uh, tax credits, which, you know, based on 30, 40, 50 percent of your income, but affordable housing that would address the needs of those clients that took vouchers and moved. Mr. Cunningham, how long has HUD known about this contamination and why did... Uh, it allowed the buying and selling of these properties without enforcing disclosures. And then there's a statement around Medicare for life to all affected residents past and present. So HUD learned, I mean, I'm not, the Housing Authority had some discussions earlier with the EPA and they've been, EPA has been on site for quite some time. Well, we wouldn't, we got 
seriously involved in this was when EPA informed the, the city through the mayor of the extremely high levels. I mean, we knew that there was some contamination here, but the extremely high levels and the mayor demanded action is when HUD became involved July of 2016 to get us where the point where we are today. So our primary effort, again, is to was to facilitate and help the housing authority address the environmental issues that were found and to make sure that we have the, the best interest of the residents in, in mind. So we've been working with them to make sure that that's been happening since July. We've issued vouchers as quickly as possible and provided as much supportive services as we possibly could to the residents through counseling and mobility counseling um, to get this to where we are today, to get the residents to be able to find new permanent homes that are lead safe. So there's a second part of the question Okay, I, I can't. The Medicare for Life is obviously not something that we that is a HUD issue. And that would. I'm just saying you can demand it, but it's not a HUD issue. It's a housing. It would go. Okay. Got it. How y'all doing tonight? Um, my name is Candace. I'm one of the residents that still stay out there in the complex, and we're being forced out. Um, I want to know, was that HUD approved? Did y'all get approval? Um, did y'all go to court to approve this forcibly move for us? Because I feel that it's not right for HUD to be forcing us out of there because it was so many residents that stay out there in the complex and we're all out here at the same time, looking at the same time for basically the same thing. Um, good housing for us to put our family in. Now, I have looked over, I have looked in so many places, so many areas for the Section 8 housing, and some of the Section 8 houses that they have on the market today is Ragley. I'm not finna move my family into no Ragley place. I'm not finna move my family into no places that have abandoned buildings by it, abandoned schools by it. So what am I to do? So now I'm forced to, since we got to, since we're getting pushed out, I'm forced to go out on my own and just rent a place without the Section 8 voucher. So I want to know, is Section 8 going to help me pay some of that rent? Because the market is high. The, the rent market is high. So my rent is going to be high. So I'm going to have to sit there and pay my rent myself. That's the only place that I have found that's, for one, enough room for me and my family to move in. Because I have ported to different places. I have ported to Hammond. Hammond downsized my family. I come from a family of five. I got four children. I have a 21-year-old. They want to put my 21-year-old in a room with my 10-year-old, but they want to include my 21-year-old income in with mine and have him pay his portion of rent when he don't even have his own space. I don't think that's right. So, I have, since this have came down on us, I've been stressed. I find myself stuttering. I go to work. I find myself crying and praying in the car. I find myself coming home in my closet and crying because I don't want to see, I don't want my kids to see me crying. I don't want them to see me break down, not knowing where we're going to go. But now we're being forced out. And then y'all want to tell me y'all going to put me in the harbor side in a three bedroom and I'm in a five bedroom. All my stuff can't fit in a three bedroom. I have a stove that I own. I have a refrigerator that I own. I have a deep freezer that I own. I have a wash machine and dryer and I, plus I have eight rooms full of furniture. Not just little stuff. I have eight rooms, four bedroom sets in everybody room. Where I'm going to put all that stuff? I want to know why are we being forced out that way? I'm not understanding. Well, I'm gonna, can I just make a statement in it or in whichever order you wanna do this? Because one of the things that I did want to uh, mention is uh, 
the psychology of crises. And I brought this up uh, in, in Flint. Um, and I, I don't know, I have not heard this talked about. In addition to the lack of coordination, in addition to the lack of, of uh, participation from the community, uh, one of the things that I would hope if HUD does anything with any property here, that they would require the city to have to have adequate public participation and input. The other thing that I want to talk about is that in Flint, uh, there have been some studies around the uh, the social and emotional health of residents in addition to the physical health. And what we are seeing is in one, just in one survey, where 66% of the residents who had children, who had adults, 21 and above, 66% 66 of those households showed an exacerbated or a worsened um, mental health state, meaning that they had increased anxiety, fear um, as a result of the water crisis and in chil in the uh, for children it, that was uh, that rate was 50 percent of households and so we know that um, when these crises come up it does uh, impact the uh, the the mental and social and emotional health of residents and we know that those things can have a cyclical effect as it relates to the the physical health because um, stress is immunosuppressor. I mean, it, it does impact the, the health of residents. So I'm hoping that, I, I don't know that there are any medical people here or that you do have um, the state medical people as we have, have in Flint that work in a coordinated fashion. But I think that that's uh, um, something that, that needs to be addressed because any type of crisis like this will cause the stress that, 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 uh, that you're referring to. So I just wanted to, to, to point um, some of those things out and, and hoping that that those that, that is addressed and then making sure that residents do have voice because um, that definitely is what I'm hearing here. And that was a, a, a obviously a problem in Flint. But because there were residents like you all who were persistent, tenacious, that's the reason why Flint was able to flip on the light to some of the injustices there that that are going on in other uh, neighborhoods such as this. So I just commend each of you and I thank each of you for, for sharing your voice with us and sharing your pain. As I mentioned earlier today, every time when you tell this story, we know that that is dredging up that, that traumatic experience again, but we, we thank you for your passion and thank you uh, for sharing. I just have two demands. Uh, number one for EPA, back in 2012, at the public hearing at the library, you gave the residents options as to the cleanup process they wanted. Um, best process actually, which would prevent, since we're on a water table, is plan 4B. That puts the barrier, instead of you having to come every five years. And um, as you have heard, everybody's concerned about bits and pieces. Clean it up completely straight down the block everybody since we are on a water table so it doesn't travel and put the barrier we don't have to worry about we're going to try or expect this that way we're protected one demand the other demand for hud well um, can you find out number one why the east chicago echa is selling um the stoves and refrigerators hot water tanks furnaces the air conditioning units and all that when number one the stoves and refrigerators contain um, insulation that collect uh, lead and arsenic, and if the homes are so contaminated, why are they be able to sell? It's right on the website, and it says items to sell, and it's a PDF file you could download. Okay, so I just want to go back to our decision about the, the emergency. I think it was going to the emergency transfers and what happened. So. If, as you recall, when the first started, we issued vouchers um, based on each's request for the Section 18 application. Um, and initially, so I think someone said this already, initially the idea was to get everyone out of West Calumet by January 1st. Uh, the, the tenants' representatives filed a fair housing complaint, so HUD negotiated between the Housing Authority and the um, Housing Authority and uh, the Shriver Center, a what we call a voluntary co compliance agreement that set out certain deadlines, guaranteed certain rights for the residents to make sure that all their relocation benefits were paid, that they had certain deadlines. And one of the things in there was this emergency transfer pr provision. On March 1st, we assessed the situation based on all the available data that there were 
diminishing number of residents, and we had to consider not only the lead contamination, but also the fact that the their, the place was 75% vacant. So we determined that at that point in time, there were enough available units between our housing partners in Illinois and, Chicago, and East Chicago to house all the remaining families, and that each of could invoke an emergency transfer. It was not a HUD order. It was nothing. It was something that we said, yes, there is enough units that the housing authority could invoke that at this time, and they have to make sure that they guarantee all their rights. So that's what we approved. We approved the authority for the housing authority to do that based on this voluntary compliance agreement. So there's been a lot of back and forth. Tenants have had grievance rights. We're going through that process right now. Um, for folks that don't want to accept an emergency transfer to a unit that they don't want. So I think that the process has worked as well as possible. We've given extended time. Folks, if they are do have an emergency transfer, will their voucher still is valid and they can continue to move to a permanent home that is lead safe. So I just want to explain that whole process and give it some context that we are not forcing anyone, we HUD is not forcing anyone out. This is a housing authority decision based on local law enforcement, the mayor, and the, to making whether or not this continues to be safe. It's a delicate balance. We understand it's difficult. We're doing everything possible to make sure that folks that don't want to move out of state don't have to move out of state, that they we can take into consideration the school. It's very important. We understand it. We can't begin to understand the hardship that the residents have gone through. This is not an easy process, and we understand that, and we, we want to make it as smooth as possible for everyone. As far as the stoves and the refrigerators, as first I've heard of it, we can look into it. And well, I'm not, I believe you, and, I, and we will we will look into it. Denise, I have. And Mr. Bellotti, is is that uh, could you respond to whether or not there should be concern around the contamination of appliances being? Resold compliance instead of or lead. Yeah, one of the things that we were doing when we were doing the the cleaning last year was all trying to wipe down all hard surfaces. Generally, it's much easier for us to actually clean hard surfaces than it is, say, fabrics, uh, carpets, curtains, and things of that nature. So, um, could appliances continue to be contaminated? I think, in the abstract, ab yeah, absolutely. But I think the things that we were trying to do is to essentially address those concerns and remediate those. Dr. Pugh, public health uh, perspective. Well, I, did, I had a question for HUD. I, it was, and I, I had asked it with the earlier question as well. Is there any way, because I, I hear you saying, that you're not making the decisions, you're taking into consideration this, the decisions that the housing authority and the city bring to you. How can you ensure that the public has had adequate participation in those decisions that are bring, being brought to you before you give a yes or a no answer? And we got, I mean, there's different processes, and there's certainly processes that where we have public input, and public input is required. Um, so, I mean, we, I think we hear that, and I think that we've also heard a lot. Um, there's some attorneys that are representing the, the clients here, and I think that 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 some of that pushback is we're getting, and and the the process is smoothing out because of the input we're getting from the representation. So, there's some processes that are. I mean, that VCA was publicly is out there and was publicly vetted. I think it was on the each it was on the website. So everyone involved in the system knew what those decision points were. Um, the, I'm not gonna, so but I also hear you that when we go forward, we need to have public processes. The housing authority or the city has consolidated plan processes that have public input as well as the housing authority. So we need to make sure that they happen. And I think HUD is committed to making sure that when we, to this process, I wasn't here when 47 years ago, not, probably many of us, some of us were, but when those decisions were in, there's a lot of different set of rules. So as we go forward, I've committed, I committed to this prior to, to the mayor and the city council that we will be here to make sure that this process goes forward, particularly when we, we are talking about what is the future of new housing in this community. Well, I guess, so 
there is this emergency. There is no deadline to move out. There's no hard and fast deadline. The housing authority has issued their emergency transfer notice that says that they're supposed to, they were supposed to be moving people out this week, and I don't think they're they've done it according to what I've seen so far. Um, so, but the housing right to find new permanent housing doesn't go away. Their voucher is still valid. What the housing authority is doing, and they're not here to to talk about it, but what they are doing is saying that it's no longer safe, they can no longer maintain the housing at West Calumet in a safe manner. So that for those families that are remaining on site, they are going to do what they're calling an emergency transfer. They're locating to a temporary unit, most of which are now going to be in East Chicago, as far as I can tell. Um, there may be some that are still going, but that number uh, to Chicago, that number is dwindling. But um, they will be able to finish school and their voucher is still valid. So they will be able to use their voucher until they expire at the end of July of, of June. And the housing authority is going to continue to work with these families to make sure that they find new permanent housing. Okay. And I also heard when they expressed about emotional help and what kind of, and, and I know this isn't anything that you would do, but who would, who would be responsible? Because I'm really surprised as Dr. Q mentioned, that this has not been addressed because this is a very traumatic situation. We're not talking about property. We're talking about people here. We're talking about lifetimes. So what will be done and, and who would be the person that would be responsible for getting immediate um, uh, mental uh, and, and emotional support for the residents individually and as a group? Can I just say one one of the things that, I mean, we've been talking about this coordination or the lack of coordination, and I think that there actually has been, and Doug, you can help, in the past, I mean, the Indiana Department of Health, the Department of Mental Health, has, we've had fairs for the residents, we have two or three listening sessions that were coordinated, both federal and state responses that have been at East Chicago, we've had them at Cary Gosh, we've had at least two or three of them where the comprehensive services through ASTDR is their um, state health department legal services. So we have had those services available and they have been here. So I, I, we have had a coordinated approach. It wasn't as robust as Flint because I'm familiar with the, how robust the Flint response was, but we have tried to model some of the things, lessons learned from, from Flint to be able to do that. And that's exactly where I was going um, because I, I'm here from Flint and I can't say, you know, I'm here listening to you and learning from you and hearing your testimonies and prayerfully I can use this when I go back to Flint, but also hoping to deposit some some points of hope. I mean, we're far from, we're, we're still moving from crisis to, to, uh, to recovery. So we're still in that process, but we have had some victories. But I, you know, I, I just have to say the coordination of service, that has, I hear that cry and it's lacking, and that needs to be a demand. Uh, that, that's a, I, I can't make a demand. I'm not a resident. As you said, I'm going to go back to Michigan. But as close to a demand, a polite ask of whoever it is that can ensure this, that there is a coordinated effort that happens on a periodic basis that is ongoing where residents know what's coming out of those discussions. I think what I heard tonight it gave me more more pause to think about how important communication is. Um, HUD was right about one thing. There's been a lot of meetings and discussions and things have been talked about tonight that we had to find a better way of communicating this back to you. Uh, there needs to be an ongoing, I don't agree, the ongoing mental health piece is very important. The separation anxiety of children and families, communities, it's is, is stagnant. I can hear it in the room. I also want to offer something that we offer in civil rights. We housing, education, uh, employment is our our, our our guard. We guard you against unfair practices. And if you find yourself running into that landlord or that that property owner who just doesn't seem to be fair in how he engages your conversations, particularly around credit, the application, things that process, we want to know about that because that's our job to enforce those rules and those policies for HUD and for our community. Last thing I'll say is this, the answer to many of the questions are from people on this panel, but also in this room. There are those of you who have gone through this process and those others who have gone through this process. In some ways, they've been successful. 
we want to hear about that because we want to learn from their success too and what, what areas that they found that were difficult, but also they're able to get through it because there's a lot more to come to this. The discussions around you heard tonight about the future of the land and the future of housing in this area is very critical. This is a time when we have to be together, folks, and look for solutions, but we have to be problem-oriented but solution-based. I want to thank the NAACP for their efforts. We want to use them as a conduit to get to you because I know it's hard to share with government. I'm proud of everyone who spoke tonight. I, I, felt, I felt the pain of many of you. I felt the understanding of the young lady. Thank you for sharing your story. I felt that. I understand. You've gone through a lot. God bless you and your family and your families. And you're going to be a survivor. You're going to continue to work for you. But the answer really is not tonight, but the nights to come. When this microphone goes off, we got to get busy finding those solutions to your questions. Um, One other thing I want to say is that we are your, are your human rights office in, in, in Indianapolis, but we also are a statewide agency. Uh, we would like to see another human rights office open here in, in East Chicago. You used to have one. Uh, we work with Gary. We work with East, uh, Hammond. We work with uh, Laporte. Uh, Lafayette and other places, we would like to see that so we can have a conduit, uh, both from both the statewide and in local. I think that would also help answer many of the questions, uh, Madam Chair, that have been offered tonight. If we had that in a statewide office, um, maybe you can help uh, encourage that in some way, but also making sure we hear your, your, your pleas uh, directly, either through the NAACP or through HUD or EPA. We need to make sure you're being treated fairly. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to express my appreciation for the invitation to come here tonight. Um, I do wish the state was here, and I, I do wish the city was here. I think that would have been an important <clears throat> uh, part of this conversation. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, the one thing I do have to express, again, I'm, I'm with the Superfund program. We had over 200 people here last summer and fall. Uh, doing cleanups here. And the one thing that all the people that have worked with EPA or our contractors said was that the community was absolutely outstanding to work with. And I really appreciate, you know, the, the respect that you've shown our folks out there. And uh, it's very, um, you know, it, 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 it certainly, it's very heartwarming for me. Um, we're out here trying to do our best to help the, the community. We are in this for the long run. Um, we're not leaving until the job is done regardless. Um, we uh, currently have a, um, a jobs training program going on uh, currently, and we're hoping that we're gonna be able to employ anywhere from 10 to 30 individuals in the cleanup efforts. Um, and potentially they would ultimately get permanent jobs with, uh, with the cleanup folks. Uh, again, I want to express my appreciation, um, and thank you. I just want to say uh, to the residents <clears throat> that this is really heartbreaking. And even though I will be returning home back to Mississippi, um, I will take this situation to heart. Um, certainly, you will not be forgotten. We will do whatever we can to keep you uplifted. Um, this is, I, I know it ha is a very traumatic experience because your, your families, you know, your, your history, your heritage, you know, has basically just been destroyed and you're being uprooted from your homes, from everything that you've known, and now you'll be going into something that is uncertain. And that's very, very unfortunate. And so I know that, you know, even though you said that we'll all be going home, and I know that we will, though, take this situation to heart, and we will take your voices, you know. Um, this has been very enlightening, so we will take what you've said to heart. And you have the two ladies, uh, Barbara's gone, but this young lady over here, Denise, she has been really... Uh, pushing this out, uplifting this situation, and I know that she will continue to do it because I, I call her the warrior princess over there. She is really a fighter, so you do have her, so one of the best, and not she is actually the best, I would say, state NAACP environmental and climate justice chair uh, that we have uh, in the NAACP, so you are fortunate to at least have her, and I am going to be, you know, really uplifting your voices 
to the masses. And I just want to say thank you again. Thank you for your voice. Again, thank you for your tenacity. And you all keep on fighting. Keep on fighting. Your community needs you. I do want to also say that before um, Mayor Karen Weaver asked that a public health person come to the city and I have the opportunity to be that person and serve the residents of Flint, I, w I worked with the NAACP in Flint. I worked for a whole year about a year there uh, on the water crisis. And so Jackie Patterson, who's here with us today, uh, can't, was there in Flint and helped us uh, right there by our side in Michigan and helped us to develop a 15 point plan based on just conversations just like we're having here and collecting data from you all just like we did, did today. And that came up with a 15 point plan that turned into a 20 point plan. That 20 point plan had several different demands just as you all stated here. Uh, and so a year later, um, now me working uh, with the city, uh, Jackie came back and we had a uh, mayor Weaver wanted to have an environmental justice summit and we did that in March. And during that environmental justice summit, we, we took a look at that plan that we put together to see how far we've come to do a status check. Many of the demands that you all are making are many of the demands that we made. We've made some strides, as I've mentioned, we still have a ways to go. And we will continue to forge uh, forward with the residents um, at the center. And I, and I pray the same for you all, but uh, I do have hope. I do have hope in the NAACP. I do have hope in the work that, that Jackie has, has done here with you all today. So you all know where to find me if you need me. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. And to uh, the distinguished panel here, to the clergy that remains, to Pastor Sloss, who uh, is our host today, um, I want to say that uh, my boss here, Jim Cunningham, has been on the ground from, day, from summer, July, to now. He's been involved in participating uh, in the negotiations and strategies that, that have been implemented. And we've heard a lot today. I want to say that as the field director here in Indiana, I want to go back and, and give to Denise um, Abdul Rahman an answer from Ms. Sherry Hunter, who wanted to know about uh, people being moved out by Friday. I want to answer Ms. Uh, Lopez's question about the selling of appliances uh, by the Housing Authority. And then Ms. Daniels lifted up a question earlier about her FSSA account. Uh, I want to get with our public housing director, Patricia Tyus, and I'm going to shoot those over to Denise abdul Rahman, and that will be the way that I want to continue to work and participate on making sure that justice hits for those residents here in East Chicago. And I, I too, want to thank the NAACP and the Twin City Ministerial Alliance for having us here. You know, since we've been involved in here, it is been abundantly clear that this is a stressful situation for the for the residents and at every turn from my role it, as a HUD administrator is to remind our staff and the partners that we work with that this is all about the residents it is not easy it the, we've never done this it's it's hard so I want to thank you again for sharing your problems and one of the things I talked to Miss Daniels right before with today and I offer this to any of the residents if there's something if there's a sticking point if there's anything that's not working this is this is not a smooth process that we've never done anything like this at HUD you can call me I'll give you I have my card you can call me and we'll try to fix it there's no the housing authority may make a mistake but we can fix it and so I think that this is an important learning session we've tried to do that all along there have been some things that have gone that didn't work and we were brought to our attention and we fix it because we listen to you either through you or your your representatives to make things right so thank you for standing tall for particularly the residents we know this isn't easy but it is our priority to get you into a lead safe permanent home with our hud assistance that is as stress-free as possible i can't guarantee the stress-free part because i know it's going to happen everyone moves and this is not a, a pleasant move but again, thank you for having us. Thank you for your voice because it is important to us to hear what can happen and what processes work and then don't work so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And I wanna just, again, say thank you to everyone because it is very important to us 
The health and safety of our the residents of HUD assisted housing is very important to us. This shouldn't we could not put this upon anyone or want this to happen to anyone. So we're in an unfortunate situation, but let's make the best of it and, and move on together looking forward to as we look to replace housing that's going to happen because I think that's another thing that we learned is that this has to be a collective process of where we go forward. I can commit John and in, in Indiana as well as our regional efforts to make sure that as we plan for new housing that it is a collaborative effort that everyone's involved because it's and I agree with everyone wholeheartedly you cannot do it. I can from a HUD perspective we need to be working with a community, not for a community, or for a community, not at a community. We need to listen to what needs to happen. So we, I, I commit today to that process going forward that as we, that HUD will be at the table as a partner with you, the community, as well as the local, local leaders. So thank you all for having us here today. I think it's been a great process. We were at the listening session earlier, as, as well as or the round table earlier and here today. Um, so thank you for all your efforts and thank you for having us and letting us be a part of this listening session. Okay. Okay, so I want to just give us a sense of what, what, what I heard, what I wrote, and I also want to remind everyone, just in case you didn't get to talk, to write down anything you want to write on the cards or write down on the paper in the back, because it'll make it into this document that we'll be working from. So some of the things we heard, we talked about the health impacts, the various health impacts, both physical health and the, the emotional and mental health impacts. We talked about some of the ways that the, the, the economy has been impacted, both in terms of property values getting lower. This morning at the round table, there was a lot more discussion about jobs and about people not necessarily being able to get to their jobs or or either, either now or are concerned about that in the future. There is also talk here about not only property values, but also as more people are leaving, then businesses and so forth will be challenged in terms of being able to stay in business. Um, we also talked about how even churches and schools, now that there are less people going to the churches and schools, they'll be suffering in terms of their ability to go on. We talked about how, um, we talked about how the concerns for people who have who have moved on from here and what their what their impacts they might be facing from having all of this exposure to these to these toxins and so forth. Um, we talked about the pattern of uh, just going back to the health a little bit. The pattern of death. One person really, really told a, com a compelling story talking about all of her family members, her lines of cousins and so forth, who have been negatively impacted. Um, and then we then we talked a lot about the demands that we wanted. So the demands included the more coordination and cooperation between agencies, a clear set of transparent plans for, for what's going on and what, what's happening, uh, long-term tracking and services, um, the 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 idea of that not of there if there's going to be a, a, another housing project that there's kind of there's a right for a prioritization of people who want to come back to be able to go into that housing but also a concern that if there is going to be housing it should only happen if the place if the place can be 100 percent cleaned up which some people were saying that they didn't think that was necessarily possible there was a demand around no dumping of pcbs which is a whole another issue that's happening the elimination of a minute eminent domain um, the, making sure that affordable housing includes rental properties when redevelopment occurs, ensuring that there's public hearings, um, ensuring that the that just kind of looking back, a concern that the buying and selling of homes didn't include disclosure. So the idea going forward that that that, that always needs to be disclosure about these these types of risks. Um, there's a demand for uh, Medicare for life, um, and uh, and then a, a concern around making sure that. There's a, there's a debate about whether these evictions are going to be actually happening forcibly because there's a, a deep deep uh, sense that there had been multiple threats to this extent. And so there's a, there's a feeling that that's going to happen, but then there's the notion that that's against the law. So a bit of a, a controversy around that, but kind of a demand that forcible evictions do not happen. And then um, a, a question around advisories to be sure that people know when, uh, when appliances are, are lead impacted. And, um, and then a, a clear need for, for mental health services, physical health services, addressing separation anxiety in the, in the children. So that's pretty much what we heard. I, again, we heard, we heard a, a lot of other things this morning as well. 
that I could go over, or um, or you'll you'll see it in the in the documentation. But some of the things that we talked about this morning included a lot more discussion around the IEPs and how kids' schooling is going to be impacted. I think we we talked about needing to have this extension so that people can stay through the end of school year. People, some um, there was some testimony about how people's scholarships are even being impacted by the moving um, moving from where they are. They might be tied to residency and so forth. We also talked about some some folks talked about how they had to move when they were when they were moving they had they had to pay fifty dollars per child to get their children registered in school and then was concerned about if they didn't have the money to pay that that amount then they would be concerned about legal issues that they might face from not being able to put their child in school so people talked a lot about those those complications and then people uh, really talked about the racism and the, the disproportionate, the fact that this is disproportionately impacting people of color and just wanting to kind of call that out and, uh, and make sure that that is, that is heard. Um, there was a lot more talk about the, the, de the depreciation of housing, housing um, of property values. And let's see if there's anything else that I'm not including here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and then a lot around um, around as people were moving to different to to whether it's Chicago, just a concern around. This has been one person talked about how she was she's 68 years old and she this is the only place that she's ever lived, and that people kind of make it sound like you know, well, you, of course you have to, to, to move because, you know, this is, this is a place that, that's contaminating your life. But she feels like, you know, this is, this is where, her, where her family is, this is where her friends are. And so there's a lot more to it than just kind of literally surviving. It's, it's really about kind of culture and community and home and what home actually means. And so there needed to be more discussion about that. There's also a concern about some of the places that were alternatives, as the sister said, um, about wanting to make sure that she has a place that's comfortable for her family and then also a good place to send her kids. And um, there was a family that was talking about the, some of the places that were proposed in Chicago, which is where I'm from, so I can say this, um, that they can be a little bit dangerous and that she was concerned that their, her, her, her son would have to affiliate to a gang in order to live in that area because everyone pretty much has to it has to do that. So there's deep concern around those types of those challenges and in, in, in the notion of moving. So I think that kind of sums it up. I again will be writing all of this up, every word that you've shared, every word that you've written. So please feel free if you haven't gotten a chance to get the mic to write down um, so that you, we make it in. And we will revisit this, just as Pam said, as we did in Flint, Michigan. We wrote it all down in a plan. We all, you know, made sure that that was part of the coordination and cooperation that you called for among agencies. And then we really held people accountable to what to what was um, what we all agreed upon. And speaking of accountability, there was also a list of responsible parties that 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 folks need felt we needed to hold to account and this morning they called out the city they called out the housing authority they called out HUD they called out EPA they called out the, the, the corporations who polluted in the first place including Anaconda BP Eagle Pitcher USS Lead DuPont then they called out the superintendent in terms of the education issues and then CDC and ASTDR the agency for toxic substance and disease registry in terms of the looking at the health impacts in the long term so this is kind of our roadmap um, for, for continuing this fight. And as, as we said, NAACP is with you in continuing this fight for sure. So thank you very much. Look for more of our reporting on the contamination of East Chicago coming soon right here on The Real News Network.